the importance of art programming in juvenile confinement settings. My name is Michael Jones. I am the Managing Director for the National Partnership for Juvenile Services. The partnership is a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving all professionals across the juvenile services continuum and ensuring positive outcomes for at-risk and delinquent youth and their families. This webinar is hosted by the National Center for Youth in Custody, a national training and technical assistance center created by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and coordinated by the National Partnership for Juvenile Services. We are very pleased to have you with us for what will be an excellent and an informative presentation. However, before we begin, I need to address a few housekeeping matters. First, this webinar is meant to be interactive, and we encourage everyone to submit questions through the chat function on your screen. Following the panelists' presentations, we will have a question and answer period, during which time we will address as many of your questions as possible. You may submit questions at any time during the broadcast. Second, at the conclusion of the webinar, we would appreciate it if you would complete a survey on the presentation. The survey will pop up automatically when you exit the program. Having your feedback is important to us as we plan for future webinars and training. Now, staff with the National Training and Technical Assistance Center will go over some technical aspects of today's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Callie Murray, and I am with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. As your technical host, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss features of Adobe Connect, which will help you maximize your opportunity to participate in today's webinar. To download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and to present our bios and photos, locate the Handouts pod directly above the chat area. Click on the name of the file, then click the download button to save these files to your computer. To send a chat message, type your message into the chat area. Hit enter or click the message bubble icon to send. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute and help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. This will help us with our final count. Again, if you are viewing with a larger group, please type in the number of additional people joining you today. If you are watching by yourself, there is no need to type anything at this time. Finally, this event will be archived on OJJDP's online university in approximately three weeks. You can also check out past webinars by NCYC that have been archived on the online university. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will now turn it back over to Michael. Today's webinar will explore the value of art programming to youth and to the overall facility operation. Panelists will discuss the importance of art integration by focusing on program development, implementation, and the merits of art programming in juvenile confinement. With the proper focus and preparation, an art program can yield positive benefits not only to the youth, but also to the facility and to the community. We're going to open the webinar by giving everyone the opportunity to hear from an educator with a 32-year teaching career. 28 of those years have been dedicated to working with disadvantaged, dropout-prone teenagers. Since 2002, he has also worked with youth in detention, developing art integration programming. He is the co-author of the Art Integrated Math Program, which teaches math through the study of art at the Lucas County Juvenile Detention Center in Toledo, Ohio. It's my pleasure to welcome Joe Safarowitz. Joe? Hello, everyone, and uh, it's great to be with you. I'm, I'm excited to share this wonderful program that we have in Toledo. Uh, I taught school for 32 years, as he said, and I worked exclusively with disadvantaged dropout prone youth. In order to be in my classroom, the students had to be two or more years behind in grade level, and they were identified as dropout prone. So I struggled all my life to do something with these kids, to get them back into the stream of school with the hope that they would graduate from high school. That was our goal. 
Many times they were absent. They were gone for long periods of time. And during my career, some of those long periods of time, many of them were spent by students in what was called the CSI, Child Study Institute, now the Juvenile Detention Center. They were gone, so I had all kinds of problems working with them and getting them back into the routine and developing a curriculum that would be able to deal with students with large gaps of absenteeism while you're trying to teach other kids what do you do? How do you account for that? Well, I knew, the point is I knew what type of kids we were working with when the Juvenile Detention Center in Toledo asked me to do a program. I was very familiar with them and I said I would do an art program here with the condition that I can teach them academics because I know from my testing, I know from my work with the kids in my 32 years of teaching <clears throat> that they were very, very far behind academically in reading and math. They were two or more behind in grade level in reading and math, oftentimes much more than that. So I asked the people here at the JDC if I could do an art program with a little bit of academics sprinkled in there so they could touch a little bit on some basic concepts and, and learn something about math, language arts, and whatever else we could do with our lesson plans. They agreed. So. I found out through working with the students and working with my co-presenter, Jan Revelle, we developed lesson plans that allowed them to do artwork. And inside of that artwork, every lesson plan had something to do with primarily math at the beginning, but now after 10 years we've been going into science and history and, and social studies and, and language arts. But we, pre, we started out predominantly thinking about math. So we did that. And we saw that while teaching math through an art program, through an art activity, we were able then to introduce lots of new skills. The kids were learning new skills, how to draw, how to work with different paints they never had worked with before, how to work with acrylics or oil or water. So they were getting excited. They were interested. And we were trying to get them reignited into the world of school and academics. So we found that they liked what they were doing, and this was one way to get them to maybe like a little bit of the academics as well. They also learned new things, such as the activities we employed by using different types of creative activities to do things with sculpture, with every art form. The activities, the concepts they explored were totally new to them, and that fascinated them as well. So the art enabled us to get their attention and to trick them in a way to thinking, oh, Maybe this is interesting, this math stuff. I do have to know about fractions. I do have to know about fractions when it comes to mixing paint, to mixing different compounds to make our sculptures. And they started to think about one half and one half, basic fundamental entry level things, but we're getting them cozier again and more familiar with academics. Then we also found out that they liked, as we expanded on this, they liked learning about the world of work in the private sector. I am a big proponent of bringing together three things, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And that is academics, the private sector, and art. They go together. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But we would introduce things to the, to the students about the private sector and how the private sector does have a relationship to the many, many art forms that we were using in the classroom and experimenting with. And we showed them how. They might not be a renowned artist and a famous artist who is. That's a very rare uh, opportunity. They're not going to become a shahuli, but there are many secondary jobs and vocations in the world of art that they could explore and learn about and be part of. We also saw that when the kids in our detention center did something in the, in, in the activity, in the art room, and they're part of an activity, and you'd walk up to somebody and say, hey, nice job. That's great. That's fantastic. This is good. I like what you did here. Did you think of that? Did you shade it that way? That positive reinforcement opportunity is always there, and art allows you to, to give them that little tap on the shoulder and say, nice job, Freddie. And also, because our art teacher 
is empathetic and knows how to write the lesson plan, allows them to express themselves. We leave the lesson open. It doesn't have to be strictly this way. This hasn't, doesn't have to be shadowed that way. Or this sculpture doesn't have to be shaped exactly this way. We leave it to them. They can put part of themselves into that sculpture. Self-expression is there for them, and they love it. They're proud of it. Now, when you do all these things, you're tapping them on the shoulder, they're learning a little bit about math, and they know that that math concept maybe you had talked about, they know they didn't know it before. They're aware of that, but now they know it. And they're cognizant of that, and they're proud of that. When you put all these things together, you gain our ultimate goal, enhancing self-esteem. That's what we're about. That's what the art is about. We enhance the self-esteem. You change their view of themselves. And when you do that, you can do things. You can make a change in their lives. The other beautiful thing about art integration is that it allows us to introduce the youth to positive role models in our community. We can bring in guest speakers who are accomplished artists. And when they come in, sculptors, painters, people who work with stone, clay, ceramics, we can introduce the kids to these wonderful, accomplished people from our city. Every city has them. And we introduce the kids to these people, and they are just flabbergasted. It's a jaw dropper when they are part of a demonstration, and they're listening to what the artists have to say. A role model is, is a wonderful opportunity for the kids to see somebody at a highly accomplished level, and then that person is working side by side with them. They've seen their artwork. They're working with those people side by side. And oftentimes, the role models share their journey. And I'll never forget, we had a demonstration with two highly accomplished accomplished gentlemen uh, on the staff of the University of Toledo, Toledo Museum of Art Sculptors. We did a special presentation for a group of girls. And one of the presenters, Mr. Robert Garcia, he said, you know, I know you look at us and you think that, oh, we skyrocketed, beelined right to where we are today. We, we knew what we wanted. We were A students, and that's why we are where we are. He said, it's just the opposite. He said, we fail time and time again quit school, flunked out, were, our roads were full of bumps and bruises. It, we have a life just like your life. The difference was we caught it, we saw what we did wrong, we, we went back to academics, we applied ourselves, we had the discipline to, to get back into the game. But don't think for a minute that, oh, these accomplished people are out there and they're special, that's not us. We are what you, you. but at an earlier time, we were just like you. Now you can change things in your life, you can study, you can work hard, and you can accomplish what we've accomplished. It's not too late, and you can do it. Anybody can. Probably, though, when you look at our art class and you're watching our kids work, it's absolutely astonishing to see how much satisfaction they get out of doing and being involved. The sense of involvement, the sense of losing track of, of the awareness of time and space and just getting involved. I could tell you stories upon stories of students, what they say to us about the lesson and how they got completely lost in where they, where they were while they were doing the lesson. The lesson also that we concoct for them and that we design allows them to learn a new skill, and it's a challenge. We don't go easy. They learn new skills that requires discipline. And our teacher, as I said, Jan does it in such a way that she's empathetic and she'll work with the kids and cajole them and, and help them because it is a difficult task at, at the start. We had a situation where one young man at JDC uh, back in uh, January was trying to do a, a certain type of sketching she was teaching, a new technique with line, and he just kept throwing his papers away. She worked with him and worked with him. Finally, through a patient intervention, they worked it out, and he did the best piece in the room. And he loved it. He was so proud of himself. When the class was over, he went to the garbage can, and he pulled out his piece. She said, what are you doing? He said, I want my first piece. I want to remember this how I went from there to this piece, and that's going back with me as remembrance, how to go about taking my time and applying myself. 
it's fascinating how they do want to learn. They're just like sponges. Uh, art programming, as I said, explores that wonderful, incredible link between art, academics, and the private sector. For every art form, for every art medium, there is a link to the private sector. They're doing ceramics for ceramics sake in our wonderful labs at the Toledo Museum. They're creating wonderful glazes, all kinds of beautiful artwork. But ceramics is also used in the brake linings of cars, in the electrical industry, and they're used in dentistry. So when you show the kids this very, very interesting connection between art, it's just not art. There, it can be, that medium can be used for many, many other things. It becomes a little more exciting and they get energized and they become more and more fascinated about this thing called ceramics or clay or, or acrylic paint, what you can do with it, or graphic design. What you're seeing here is a slide of a cityscape. The, side, the slide of the cityscape is black. That was presented to a group of kids from a youth treatment center. Every object other than the black was a screen provided for the boys in that class, and they learned how to make that particular snowflake or hands or square. But this was a culminating lesson after they had each done several of their individual slides, uh, screens. They were asked to do a group piece by the teacher. And the teacher said, remember now, place your screen wherever you like. Do whatever you want, but remember, the next guy's coming around. Give him room. Let Do yours in such a way that it complements what's going to be coming after you. Think about the next guy. So it was a, a team piece, and they really had a wonderful, wonderful time doing it. And this is how the boys, working with an artist in screen printing, signed their pieces. And they had their thumbprints all over. And this piece will go on exhibition. This is the young lady, adjunct professor in three universities, a screen printer. She's showing the boys her work. She was juried into this exhibition called Roots of Diversity in Toledo at the, in the lobby gallery of the Third Fifth Bank. She showed them through the gallery, and then she came to her section, and they were fascinated by how she did her screen printing. And what happened is after this tour, she went to another lab. We took them to another lab at the Art Supply Depot owned by a ceramic artist. And there in the lab, this young lady did screen printing with the kids. But this is a, an accomplished artist, a, a teacher who is in this jury exhibition and many others. And this is the type of teacher that the kids work with, the type of professional who, from, she works at the Arts Commission Greater Toledo, works with them and has the patience to create lesson plans and the, for these kids, and we meet these types of people in our city all the time. Every city has them. We are blessed. Every other city, I'm sure, is blessed as well to use the art people that are out there, out there to work with the kids. Every time I ask somebody, could you please work with us, it takes 30 seconds, and these people say, yes, I was one of them. I did struggle. I know what art can do. The next slide, you see kids working with watercolor. We picked them to do a very difficult watercolor activity. They went out to a lab, worked with a, a, a highly acclaimed watercolorist, uh, a role model like you wouldn't believe. His name is Aaron Bivens. Aaron talked to them about color, mixing color. We talked about solutions, but we also talked about how difficult it is to control that watercolor on the paper. That's where the science came in here in the math. The paper comes in six different types of papers, all of which control the water of the watercolor in such a way that's different each time. And the artist picks a certain paper to work with the kids. And they learn about that. They learn about the dryer, what, what's happening, when to put down the, what color, when. Uh, but there's a little bit of science in there. We talk about the heat, expansion, contraction, the paper. It was fascinating. Uh, I just made my picture smaller. There it is. OK, the next slide. We see oftentimes how they get involved, the kids get involved, 
and they take what they do extremely seriously. They never, ever take it lightly. They are very intent about doing the best job they can, and it shows up every lesson that we get involved in. And it, it fascinates us to see how much they want their piece when they're done, and when they leave whatever facility they're working in, working with us in, they ask to take their piece home. It's a struggle for us to keep their pieces to put on exhibition. This is the koi fish the boys were all working on. They worked with Aaron Bivens. This is his piece, and this is Mr. Bivens. He's an interesting fellow. He's a retired out of a UPS in Toledo, Ohio, and he started as a teacher, an art teacher, was an art major, went to UPS, but he's the Hall of Fame linebacker at the University of Toledo. We talked football, of course, with these guys. They wanted to know all about his career. He still holds the tax league record at the University of Toledo. He's in their Hall of Fame, and he even did a, a short stay with, I believe it was uh, the Miami Dolphins or Cleveland Browns, but they were fascinated to see that this athlete, this man, was, loves to do this, and this is what Aaron does now. He is a artist now upon retirement. He has in-services and works with many, many groups in the community, and he was very, very willing to work with us. We were lucky to get him. He's come here on several occasions and talked to 60 or 80 of our guys. And speaking of this institution and people coming in here, we have had music presentations here, and that's not easy to do. We had to bring in four sections, all separate at a separate time, so we don't have every, all the units in the halls. And I brought in a trio of uh, three uh, jazz musicians from the University of Toledo. It was absolutely amazing what the kids thought of it. Upright bass, vibes, and drums. And they wanted to know how much the instruments cost. Can they come and take lessons? And they were, we talked about music and counting and, and note values and fractions because that's what music's all about. And they absolutely were enthralled, and we jammed, and they just loved it. We couldn't end the session. They were asking so many questions. This last couple slides is super, super interesting to us. On December 10th, the wonderful administration that we work with here, that's, that's a blessing, first of all. We've got people that support the arts, from Judge Denise Coven to Dan to, uh, to uh, Deborah Hodges, we have a great supportive staff, and we, this, this staff put in money to create this exhibition. For years, Jan and I, and my art teacher, would sit in class, and we would say to ourselves, how can we get the rest of the world to see what these kids do? It's not what they think. These kids are not what the people out there think. I know what they think. I hear what they have to say. How can we get them to see the kids the way we see the kids? the cooperative, disciplined, caring kid that we work with daily. So we talked and talked, and we can't bring the people here. So we said, let's put the artwork out there, right in the main lobby. And I went to the judge. Judge Cubman says, sure, let's do it. So we found money, she did, and we created this display. This is the display, lighting, I mean, it looks like a gallery, lighting, and you see pieces up on the wall, and that's a certain hardware system we had to purchase. It cost around $9,000, and that allows us to hang the artwork without putting any holes in the wall. But you see here, artwork on this floor, we have additional artwork on the second floor, same way, to the total of 21 pieces. And each of the 21 pieces is an example of a specific type of art lesson. So people come in here and you, I sit back in the lobby and oftentimes you watch people, they'll go right up and nose to nose, inches away, and they'll look at the artwork. This last slide is part of that same exhibition which, which allows us to put in work from the kids that we work with here at the JDC as well as people from the Youth Treatment Center. We have a program there that takes kids out into the community. It's an eight-week program. They work there, do artwork, and then I take them out into the community to meet that Erin Bivens and that young lady that you saw showing her print work. Uh, we want them to go out and meet them. It, it, oftentimes, those activities are structured around a hands-on 3D type of activity, and these are special kiosks made to showcase all the 3D work. The kiosks were made by the same company. They're screwed down tops. You can't pick them off easily. Uh, there's, a, there's a knack to it. And 
they are also in the main lobby just before that wall so that people will see what these kids are capable of. This will be turned over every nine weeks, constantly showing the artwork of the kids in both juvenile detention in Toledo and youth treatment program. And I think that's my time, isn't it? Thank you, Joe. That was, that was very good. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask one quick question here because I saw it pop up on the screen. Someone wanted to uh, uh, have you repeat the name of the artist that was the ex-football player, if you wouldn't mind to do that just quickly. Oh, yeah, a great story. Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, <coughs> Bivens. And I'll tell you one little thing about Aaron Bivens. Aaron Bivens also is in that juried exhibition that we attended. You saw the young lady talking about her prints. Uh, her name is Michelle Carlson. Erin Bivens has several pieces in that show. One of the pieces is a piece of, piece of Maya Angelou. And she, he called Maya, sent her a painting of Maya. She called him and w Michelle, the tour guide, related that story to the boys. And they found that to be very interesting. Erin Bivens. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Our next presenter, Dan Jones, is the Vice President of the Ohio Juvenile Detention Directors Association and also the Administrator of the Lucas County Juvenile Detention Center. Dan can provide a first-hand account of art integration and the success that he's seen from Joe's efforts over the past few years. Dan, welcome to the program. Thank you, and just thank, I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to uh, quickly speak on on what we do here in detention and uh, just to be able to verbalize how much I appreciate what, what has been brought in here and the effects it does have on our kids. Um, just real quick about our, our facility, uh, as, as you had stated, I'm a practitioner of detention. We do it on, on, on a daily basis. Uh, here we, we, have, we have very good kids who have made some, some, some pretty bad mistakes at times. Um, what we, we have about an average daily population of about 32 last year. Our average length of stay is a little over eight days. We have 125 bed maximum um, bed facility. So we're, we're an innovative court and the JDI site. And the type of youth that we have, uh, just, just so people kind of know what type of youth uh, we're talking about, is, is we have many different alternatives to secure detention. We hold uh, youth who who present a danger to society only. So basically if it's a violent misdemeanor or a felon, they're here. So if you could see the type of kids that we work with and, and then when you hear of the success that they have and how much they enjoy the program, you can quickly see that if our kids love it, I think any, any type of kid would love it. So um, what we have is we have our integrated math here, Joe's program, we have that uh, five days a week, and one of the reasons that we have a five days a week is because it, it does help us meet our, our mandatory ODE requirements. Jan Ravel, who Joe spoke of, we are extremely blessed to have her. She is also a um, licensed certified teacher, so that helps us in, 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 with art. It helps us with the kids being here and then the kids wanting to, to actually do the work because they see that it means something and that, and that school work is, is a seamless transfer over to their school. So that way they're, they're not just sitting here doing, they kind of see an end result for that. Um, there's a lot of positive incentives that we have for the youth to go there. We, we, we rarely have behavioral problems at all in, in the art room. We, we do have some in, in the traditional school classes, but in the art room, the, the kids kind of see that more, more of, a, of a privilege to be there. So we rarely have any, any type of uh, drama going on or any type of altercations in there. It's a very safe room. The kids do enjoy it. They do get to talk. Jan, as I said before, she does a, an amazing job. Uh, she's very attentive in what she does and, and who kind of sits where. Uh, for example, when the kids come in, they have a, um, empty tables, blank tables, nothing on the table. So when they, when they come down, Jan may pass out some paperwork and kind of get a feel of the room, look at the atmosphere, see, what, see where it's at, and then she may make a, a change to her project may not, and then when she passes out stuff, she counts it out in front of the kids. She'll recount it in front of the kids when they leave, so that way that she knows and the kids know both uh, how many pencils are down, how many uh, pair of safety scissors are down, everything. And she also will, will let the juvenile detention officer know as well, hey, I'm going to be setting six pencils down at this table. That way all six pencils get picked back up. Um, 
again, that's crucial in, in having a 24-hour detention facility that safety is going to have to will, will supersede and be very important um, to what we do here. Not only is it a it's a very structured environment. Jan also has lesson plans, and in, in she, as I said before, she is just extremely vigilant in what she does. Um, she definitely pays attention. If there's something going on, she'll kind of whisper it or pass a note over to the to the JDO to kind of keep an eye on things. And in in our units, that we we always have you know one to two JDOs who have constant eyes on supervision uh, throughout the entire process. The youth actually, uh, when they leave, as I kind of heard Joe mention this before, when, the, when they leave, they'll get released or whatever destination they're headed to. Uh, it's kind of funny because at times they'll ask if they can go back and get their artwork or they'll get ready to leave and, and you're thinking of all the different things that are on their mind to be able to go home, see their family, um, friends and family, and, and just different things that, that have been taken from them here. And as they're sitting downstairs getting ready for, for release, they want to run back upstairs and get their art project that, that they made with Jan. So it's, that, that right there kind of tells you how, how important it is and, and how important it is to the youth. I think that the, the youth have to actually get an opportunity to create something that they're proud of in, in the projects that they never thought they could do before. Like be, you, you see an end project, and right away they say, I can't do that. So Jan kind of gives it to them in baby steps and doesn't even show them what the end project's going to look like until they're done. Because some of them are, are used to failing, and if they see that end project, it's just going to be too much, and they don't even want to try it. So it, not only does it give them an opportunity to create something, but it just gives them a chance to, to do something different and to say, you know what, I can do this. These, you know, not only can I succeed at this, but these, these credits transfer, and I can do this. I can do this in school as well. Um, not only do the kids love it, but the, our staff actually enjoy it too because it helps the kids develop listening skills, a, a feeling of trust, manners, respect, all those different types of things that just lead to better self-esteem and, and a better outlook. That kind of runs and, and, and couples with our RBT program, and that's exactly what we teach as our behavioral program. Um, so our, the, the Joe's Art Integrated Math program just fits right in when, when it comes to um, our, our COG groups and the rational behavioral therapy and every, everything that we run here just kind of goes seamlessly uh, hand in hand. Uh, one of the, some of the things that, as you can see on the screen, that why I would enjoy it as an administrator is because, again, uh, altercations are, are down, especially in, in the art room itself. We rarely, rarely have any altercations whatsoever in the art room. Um, the the altercations between youth and staff, same way that we have, we have consequences uh, with inappropriate behavior. So the kids know right away, hey, I want to go to art. Uh, they do what they're supposed to do, and, and their behavior shows that it's pretty. It, their behavior is good. Um, the other thing is, when I was kind of saying, it gives them the create the opportunity to create stuff. Is they don't really take that opportunity out on the back of our doors or on the walls like they used to. We used to have a lot of graffiti and, and, and writing on, on the walls and on the back of the doors. We don't get so much of that now. At times, that does, you know, a, again, reverting back to safety and security, that we do have some, like I said, the safety and security issue is always, always, always big here. And one of the things that we have is a, is a large list in the, in the art room where everybody can see it. And on those, on that list is. Uh, it's, a, it's a list of different things that, that aren't prohibited in the art room, whether it be the number 55, whether it be a pitchfork or a crown, um, and, and different stuff like that to signify gangs and, and the different sets from around the area. That kind of just helps keep the altercations down. And with that, we, again, having somebody vigilant like Jan, we, we ensure that uh, a lot of times the colors, uh, we don't do primarily red, primarily blue. She makes sure that she integrates many different colors and, and many different things, so one kid just can't uh, do a little piece of artwork that is, is kind of on the down low, signifying to everybody else where he's from and what set he's from and, and things such as that. Uh, and, and truly, when they go in there, that's kind of the last thing that they do. You know, Jan, not only does she pay attention to safety and security, but she, she does like the, the color theories and like, like with the different warm colors and cool colors, she does all of that kind of stuff to, and, and to demonstrate to the kids how our brains see different colors and what that means. And, and as Joel said, she kind of mixes that art with the science. They do a lot of mixing of paint 
they do a lot of estimation on, on different t things drying, different materials drying. We have, um, which I thought I never would say, but you know, back in the day, but we actually have some, we have fish and some different insects, some reptiles, you know, different things like that, and, and they're in the art room as well. The kids absolutely love that. Um, and I, and I got to be honest, staff do too. One of the one of the major things that that, that I have problem with is is that it, we don't allow staff to participate too much in, in, in any activity because they're being paid for eyes on supervision. Um, and at times we do have to kind of get on staff because they want to do the projects with Jane and the kids, which would be fine. But then uh, we always got to kind of make sure that somebody's actually watching the kids too. So. Um, the, the cultural education is, is amazing here as well. Uh, one of the things that they do, it, that, that Jan does, is we do a lot of like Native American pots, African masks, um, we do African prints, uh, the original tie-dye from China, and, and Celtic designs I think she's working on now. Just many different things like that that I, I think that also get the kids in touch with, the, with their cultural education as well. Um, let me see where we're at here. Yeah, that I was just thinking about the, the math and science. One of the things that we were pretty blessed with is University of Toledo got us uh, donated several microscopes for us. And the youth uh, absolutely love the microscopes. Uh, they, they'll put anything underneath of the microscopes and, and have fun with that, try to draw it, do different things with it. Uh, Jan was kind of sharing with me when, when she brought them in, just another example of, of safety reasons and safety precautions is that she doesn't use glass slides, that she actually uses plastic slides that she cuts out. So that way the kids can't have glass slides. A lot of, thing, a lot of different things like that is the same with when, when a youth gets done with a project and they want to leave it here, Joe or Jan or somebody may want to put it up on a wall or do something like that. Uh, they're only allowed to put like their first name for confidential reasons. We don't we don't allow them to put their first and last name. So um, I think some of, some of the important things, if if somebody is looking at uh, from a detention center's point of view, somebody's looking at trying to start up a program, is is get to like what we did here is we worked with Joe. We made sure we found the right fac facilitator and Jan in getting her in here. Like I, we're very blessed. Um, she has a, a psychology degree along with an art therapy degree. And to us, who, who better to work with at-risk youth who have experienced some trauma than somebody like that? She has a, an unmatched passion, and that coupled with Joe's background in teaching disadvantaged youth and his passion, it's a it's a win-win here. And it's, it's easy that when we have, and when I have any sort of security um, problems or, or something that I'm uncomfortable with, just to pick the phone up and say, hey, Joe, you know, this is Dan. I'm having an issue with a, a substitute teacher, or maybe this project coming up. I, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, as long, just being comfortable and be able to sit down and, and have that discussion and, and having him understand where I'm coming from because what my responsibilities are in keeping the kids and staff safe, it, it, it's a great match. And it's a, it's a match that's been very successful for over 10 years. And, and we're looking at keep going forward with it. Um, one of the things, realistically, that, that people will have to hurdle is the cost of a program like this. Uh, but again, there, there's ways around that. We currently fund the program through Title I. Uh, Title I funds the program, so it doesn't come out of our general budget. And uh, we're very thankful for that, because not only does it, it keep the kids uh, busy, staff enjoy it, kids are learning something. Um, it's, it, like I said, it's also uh, it's, it's, a, it's a seamless streamline right into the educational system with, with credits being transferred and the kids sitting down, they, they know that they're doing this work and they know that those credits are being transferred. So uh, they're, the kids love that and they're very happy with that. So um, the project, we're actually working on a project right now. I don't even think Joe's aware of it. But I just talked to Jan and uh, where this is just, just a quick example of how something that that I've, I've wanted for a long time, how easy it comes to fruition. She, we just had a conversation, and I wanted a wall painted in a, like, a, like a large banner or something on it that says positive, not punitive. And I asked J uh, Jan if she could give me some ideas and examples. We're going to paint over a wall, and, and she gave me some examples of, 
of how she of how it can be painted and, and you know the the word positive being in bright colors all in one and and the word punitive kind of being siloed like brick crumbling and we're going to get four youth uh, to to give her a hand in some of the painting and stenciling and and drawing it on the wall and that's something that I wanted for a long time just to have that it's a pretty powerful message to have up there for the kids and the staff so um, the, all all that is just is part of what art does here for our kids. It's just a huge outlet for them to to get stress out, get things off their chest. And, and again, there's a lot of different programming. I I, uh, I get I guess it really wouldn't be uh, um, I wouldn't be honest if I said there's, the, the kids love all of our programming. So at times uh, there's consequences and things like that uh, that the that we do have to issue out because the kids don't want to partake in some programming because but un, you know very fortunate for us art is not one of them so we we kind of structure that around the day to because we know that the kids enjoy it so um scheduling's scheduling's always a problem so that's that's one of the things that that somebody will have to t to deal with if if they're running a, a facility but again um if if, if you're interested at all in like your ODE requirements and your educational requirements that you have to reach for the day, I mean for the year, that's something that you have to prioritize and, and you can schedule, schedule that right in with, with the rest of your schooling. So um, it tremendously helps us out that it helps us. We actually exceed the ODE, ODE requirements, so um, that, we're very happy about that. So um, that's all I have. I can send that back to you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Job well done. Our final presenter today is an award-winning assemblage artist who refers to herself as a professional imperfectionist. Her work carries underlying messages of rebirth, recovery, and reclamation through an array of salvaged and recycled materials that she employs in her jewelry creations and teaching style. Jerry Florida began her work with delinquent populations in 2009 piloting a volunteer jewelry arts program in the Schumann Juvenile Detention Center in Pittsburgh, the first of its kind statewide involving the use of what otherwise would have been prohibited tools in a detention setting. And Jerry, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. And Joe and Dan, you did an excellent job and I ditto everything that you said. Um, I'm going to try to stay scripted because I was really excited and, of course, wanted to chime in. Joe and I, I had a conversation, actually several conversations, and um, what he said is right on target. And Dan, also, we experienced the exact same in our detention center. So I'm going to try to take a little bit of a different spin on it. And I'll put up the first slide. Callie, I'll be putting up the slides. We've uh, called our studio Schumann Design Studios. We've changed it from the art room because we've gotten into some external work and a, and a lot of outreach work, and the kids are feeling a lot like artists. So we decided to create logos, um, artist statements, business cards, and advertise ourselves as Schumann Des Design Studios. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what really happens in our art room. And we separate the tangible art projects from the intangible because I'm very big on using art as a healing component. We use recycled and perfect materials because it easily parallels um, the imperfections of our lives and we create something beautiful at the end of it. So we try to integrate our philosophy subliminally through the materials that we use. And be mindful, we're nurturing a creative mindset. In our art room, what I experience, and I'm the Title I art teacher, and I work five nights a week, um, in order to capture 100% of the audience, I have multiple projects going on at the same time. We, as Dan and Joe, have to count all of our materials, but I generally put the kids in charge of that. So I very easily hand over the responsibility, um, tell them how many pencils we have, how many markers. We have pencils, jewelry, supplies, uh, markers, all of that out at the same time. And the kids will make sure that that's all collected, otherwise they don't leave the room. Um, 
our arts program, I'm very proud of Schumann because I came in as a volunteer and I proposed the jewelry arts program to them. And for that entails um, tools that are considered contraband. We use files, we use hammers, we use anvils, uh, pliers, round nose pliers, wire, wire cutters. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get to the visuals. Um, but we also have a lab bolt department, and we'll be doing robotics this summer. We do an extensive amount of writing, um, poetry writing. In the art room, we collaborate a lot. So the kids write the poems, and then they come to the art room, and we create the backgrounds for the poems, where we translate the poems onto the art pieces. Um, this summer, we hope to be doing soldering with jewelry. Um, we do skits, put on play. So we're, our facility um, is very proactive in the arts and reaching the kids through that way. Um, let me, so I'm going to stay focused here so I don't double up on what Dan said. Let me change slides. I've also created a simple formula for art, and it's three components. What, what's already happening, or in other words, what's been done, what's not happening, and that's the blank canvas that we have, and what can I do to create something new with the resolution to the problem? And that's the formula we use in the art room as well. But that's kind of universal. It can be kind of uh, adapted almost into anything that we do. The mission, uh, let me see if I have, let me backtrack, okay. Art is not simply about thinking outside the box or coloring inside the lines, but about creating the lines and the box to think in and out of. I invite you to listen with an open mind, forgiving heart, and caring intent. All of you here today work in environments that are very mechanical, controlled, and disciplined, concrete both figuratively and literally. It would be wonderful to inject the humanity into the rehabilitation mix through the arts to allow the creation of ideas to formulate designs that affect change within yourselves and others within the confines of the workplaces that we have. So let's start by redefining art and the common misconceptions. And I looked this up on the computer because as an exhibiting artist through the years, I hear all this negative about the arts and, uh, and about artists and about the outcome of artists. And as everyone knows, the funding for the arts is the first to get cut. So the misconceptions, art's not about drawing or drawing a dog or a cat that looks like a dog or a cat. It's not, about, it's not a useless ability. It does not breed broke, loner, flaky, irresponsible, dark, recluse individuals who can't get a job or have no business sense. But what it is, is art is about wonderful pro professional possibilities that we rely on every day that all begin in an art room. Art creates a mindset of possibilities separate from the tangible projects we create in class. So for today, let's change the word art to creative arts or creative mindset because that's the area that I take my students. I'm moving to the next slide. The mission is to create an accepting environment that challenges negative attitudes, expectations, and replaces them with attitudes of determination, belief, for self-change through art. I looked up the word creative in the dictionary, and it says having or showing an ability to make new things, involving the process by which new ideas, stories, etc., are created, done in an unusual way. In my work as a teaching artist, I find work working with adults I have to unteach them first before I can teach them new ideas. I dispel attitudes and beliefs and give them permission to learn another way. And I guess I'm addressing you as adults because you may also have those attitudes. Um, I tell my classes, my adult classes, I'm going to mess up your hair because they, they're used to some kind of formal process. And adults really fear mistakes and they ask too many, can I do this question as if I have an answer for an outcome. Kids, on the other hand, and Dan and uh, Joe, you probably know, don't pay that much attention to what we say, but they really watch what we do. And they do it fearlessly, and sometimes even without permission. 
So at what age did we trade in that just doing for just asking? And um, that happened somewhere in our adulthood. So let's broaden the scope of how we define an artist. And I include all of us. We are all creative creatures, and that separates us from animals. To simply survive, we have to adapt a creative mindset. We do artsy things daily and don't even recognize it. We plan our daily agendas, creatively allocate our time. We create meals, sometimes improvising ingredients. We choose outfits, hopefully fashionably. We decorate our houses, our own, in a innate feng shui style. To what degree do you allow yourself to get stuck in your thinking inside a box with misconceptions about your own creative ability? Because adults seem to have difficulty understanding and translating the characteristics that we learn as artists into our everyday life. So in order to think outside the box, you have to reopen your mindset and define, with permission, the creative mind as one with ability, possibility, vision, belief, fearless to experiment, and a conscience. And we all have one, a box to crawl out of and a, even more to create. So how many of you now are in that mindset? Let me change the screen. Our uh, facility is 90% boys. And when I first started as a volunteer, I volunteered for two sessions and was immediately hired by the Title I summer school program because I brought the jewelry arts program um, to the center. And um, in no better words, I put it, was able to legally sedate the kids with a box of beads. Um, the reason I decided to start as an artist to bring the jewelry arts into the setting is the uh, painting arts, the sculptural arts, all give the same le level of satisfaction, but not the immediate gratification that you can get from a design jewelry piece. In other words, the kids can create a bracelet or a necklace, and they can put it on, and within minutes, they have two or three people complimenting them, and that's coming from the outside. And we can't get that with sculpture, unfortunately, or paintings, because we can't wear them and we can't present them to the public. But we can do it with something as small as that, because jewelry you are able to display, you can use it, you can sell it, and you can gift it. You know, it's a, it's a good icebreaker for when you have difficult relationships. You make a bracelet, and our kids do that. Um, we have an innovative arts program, and we've been incident-free for five years. Um, and w my urgency was also to address the students through immediate gratification before they reach the adult facility, because our average ages are from 13 to 18. And you know when they get 16, you start to worry if they're repeat offenders, that we really need to grab them emotionally in some way and start to uh, enhance those those qualities that we struggle with because our competition is the streets. Once we let them out, you know, we're just a molecule in their lifetime, three days or eight days of detention or however long. So we have to make very powerful statements within the short time that we have. Um, we do coloring, painting. I also teach free draw, simulated. I do a simulated art gallery, which requires the math. Um, where we measure the square footage of the room and how much money needs to be generated through that square footage. Um, we estimate our cost for expenses, utilities, payroll. This is all imaginary. And then we take art that has been left over or unfinished, and we use that to hang in our gallery. And, and we vote on it, and that's where the fun comes in. It's almost like an auction. But the kids will put a price tag on the art. And then I have to remind them that that wall space has to generate so much money, and how are we going to make payroll and uh, all of our expenses at the end of, end of the month. So we do find ways to integrate the academics um, in our art programs whenever we can. But I l also integrate that healing process that's so kind of uh, universal and ingrained in me. Um, requires, jewelry arts requires no previous or traditional art experience, no age requirement. Most projects can be completed in less than an hour and are simply fun and creative. And I'm going to move on to this next one. Safety and security. Um, because we're bringing in tools, um, 
that are considered contraband, our, our initial concerns was could that be handled? And I allowed the, stu the uh, residents to create the studio rules and then be in charge of the tools and incorporate their innate uh, leadership ability to follow studio rules, and they've been very good about doing that. I think we have several slides on safety and security, so I want to just kind of go through them. I have a video at the end that I that I would like you to see. Now, let me see how many slides we've got. And you can read these, and I, you will get the printout of them, so we don't have to go over all of them, but I'll bullet the, the important ones. Um, the first one, builds trust. What's amazing to me is that students have such a poor self-perception of themselves. They've asked me, Ms. Florida, what have you done wrong to be working with us? And that says a lot in that statement. But through particularly the tools, they prove to themselves that they can be trusted. And then, of course, they're very proud of the fact that they prove to us and they've earned the privilege. So we rely very much on trust in the art class. Uh, let's see. Provides trusting environment, providing opportunities to learn respect for materials and tools and authority, and again creates a mindset of possibilities. When you have multiple media's in a, in an art room, you're presenting multiple problems. It's not like math where everything is pencil, paper, and calculations. One day we might have sculpture. And we have a whole set of different problems that have to be solved. And we do bring our math calculations into um, some of the uh, uh, geometric work we do. So it invites possibilities to, save, to uh, solve problems in different ways. Of course, critical thinking uses academics. We covered that. It helps develop creative, critical thinking, logic, and pro problem-solving skills. Um, the benefits of the art program, and this gets, can go on and on because as Joe and Dan talked about, I have to ditto everything um, that they said. Okay. Uh, provides a safe place to try without embarrassment or fear of failure in mistakes or mistakes. We have a lot of residents that come in that have never succeeded at anything. And um, this allows them to be able to work privately and to work out some of those mistake issues, because ultimately almost everything turns out beautiful. And we assign them um, that ability to recognize that their work is unique and different from the next person. What is really kind of amazing is that we can take them out of that group mentality because the, their artwork is not a shared experience. So they're allowed to individually work on something and build that individualism that they've somehow lost on the outside. And I'm going to scroll through these because I think we have a lot of pages of benefit, benefits. Creating something of value to others. Again, as I said, people view their jewelry and staff wants to buy it. Creates a sense of self-acceptance as well as acceptance of others. They share uh, in on the art room. Um, I put two boxes of beads out on the table, very heavy boxes that I get at the grocery store, and we fill them with beads. And I learned that three weeks after being, uh, being there that um, that's sort of uh, the way to go. And they come in, and the, the beads are very sedating to them. They'll put their hands in them like they're Chuck E. Cheese's balls, and they'll start to play. And I have stretchy cord that they can start to build a bracelet. Uh, the talisman. It, am I? My time says 4.29. Is that where I'm at? OK. Um, we did a talisman project, which was a very empowering art project. And we're dealing with the power struggle here. The goal is to interrupt the negative programming and identify, target, and nurture to create esteem build builders like passion that are greater than the negative experience and grudges that they um, carry from the outside. Here we have a, and I'll go into the Talisman project because I do have visuals for that, a collection of ICANs from the, from the students which I'll scroll through so you can read them, because I'm looking at my time, and it's 344. Um, we've done an extensive job on building community partnerships. 
We have had five major exhibitions. We, I work very closely with an organization called the Society for Contemporary Craft. Um, I'm affiliated with that organization as a resident artist and exhibiting artist. They've offered exhibition opportunities. Um, we did a first-time exhibition where 14 international artists were invited to address the um, issue of violence. 31 of our students' work were included in that exhibition. From that exhibition, I traveled it to five additional locations across the state. Um, and um, the organization has also offered us scholarship opportunities, volunteer opportunities, employment opportunities, residency programs. We have visiting artists come in, as we did for the Enough Violence show, and donations of supplies. Uh, here is one of our exhibitions at our city county building. And I think I just lost the link. Okay. And that was conducted at the city county building from the Env Enough Violence show. Now I'm going to go on to some of the students' work. If this scrolls through. Okay, Callie, I'm Enough a violence show here. that we put together was an opportunity to engage much more deeply in the All community, right. working have, with new partners um, in fields the beyond the show. arts. A, lot of this work a was craft created. museum. Uh, with the is calling of, of Altoid tins, a criminologist. And filing Altoid this tins and, um, is strange. Creating memory boxes, what I didn't know uh, from those is that tins. the Society I'm for Contemporary Craft is an institution uh, that is so intently focused so I'm not sure what on bringing together artists uh, with sure, it's okay. you people from you other segments oh, I do? Uh, okay. of uh, I've, I've lost my screen. Uh, who Can you look take look at issues from different perspectives. Video? Um, yes, absolutely. That they were right, prepared so to facilitate exactly our discussions that. and okay. meetings uh, in a really extraordinary way. And the result was, what can I say? It was a, a revelation. Our third core value uh, is yeah, play connecting the video. Uh, with I think you can cue it community. in at four. And we believe that four, zero, arts organizations and like ours have not just um, an opportunity, but a that we responsibility to take leadership in this area. Well, how could an art object show. or a beautiful piece of leatherwork or copper enamel, how could that have anything to say or do or offer, uh, let's say, a, an urban school? Um, that is dealing with the problem of weapons and all sorts of things of that sort. What could an object have to do with that? I asked in my ignorance by bringing members of the community uh, through the exhibit, by giving them hands-on experience working with objects, by listening to people who come into the museum who may not normally come into places of uh, where the arts are highlighted. Um, they created a safe space for dialogue about issues that communities usually have a hard time talking about. One of the important aspects of hands-on learning that we offer is that for some young people, a hands-on experience allows them to find their strengths, their unique voice, and skills that they hadn't even discovered that they possess. For uh, some students, it's made a tremendous difference. We've heard from their teachers that suddenly they saw a different child in front of them and were so impressed that this individual was stepping forward into a new leadership role. Whenever I came to SCC, I think it's like a good, a good place because it's calming and it's quiet. You know, it's just real peaceful and you can like just, you know, kind of like do your own thing. I see myself growing in the um, jewelry, you know, departments and things like that. And SCC apparently has taken me under their wing, who I have taken the kids under their wing, and trying to bring every and anyone that will listen to us on board to um, open up their eyes about the difficulties we have here. And the main thing is that these kids can be saved. They can be saved. She smiled so much and we communicated and
Um, Sherry, we just finished the video. Did you want to continue with your slides? Yeah, okay, I, I'm back on screen. Um, this right. is uh, one of the presentations we made after the Enough Violence show. We took our work to the women working in juvenile corrections and juvenile justice national conference. We sold our jewelry under the Schumann Jewelry Design label, and we raised $500 at that event. The Enough Violence exhibit then went uh, back to Schumann to their lobby and we took one of the four showcases that we originally had at the city county building. Um, the Enough of Violence exhibit traveled to the Metropolis Gallery in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, home of our Department of Corrections. Um, this is an example of some of the work that the kids created that went on sale. We also sold in 2012, um, raised $700 for the Humane Society of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a photo of the, or a template of the Talisman Project, the empowerment jewelry that we created um, that went on exhibition for the Enough Violence show. Um, we do a lot of community outreach and that raises the esteem of the residents who have poor self images and they're totally thrilled that um, uh, our community pays attention to their work and validates their uh, existence. Uh, I think I'm out of time here. Can I go on to the last one? Yeah, sure. Just wrap it up, Jerry. That's, okay. that's fine. All right. The ways to keep uh, students integrated and grounded, we've made uh, particular um, attempts to ground them to the outside art community. Um, we donate our work to homeless shelters, senior facilities. We enter youth art contests, and we generate sales from our work that's um, uh, to benefit the Western Pennsylvania Humane Society or the charity of their choice. And you saw the video and our success, which you will have. So thank you very much. This has been a very exciting opportunity. Um, we obviously have more than 20 minutes uh, to talk about it, but we welcome your questions and we'll be glad to respond. Thank you, Jerry, and, and thanks to to Joe and to Dan, uh, great information that everybody shared today. And, and as Jerry said, we do have a number of questions to get to. Uh, and it, we won't be able to get to all of them, but you'll have their contact information if you want to follow up with them individually. Uh, that would be great. Uh, Joe, I'm going to kick this off by, by coming to you. Um, and, and Dan and Jerry, feel free to chime in. For those in the audience who are not teachers or artists, what guidance do you have for them on how to start the process to implement an art program in their facility? I think the first thing to do would be to identify a unit to work with. That's what we did. We started with one unit. We started with simple lessons, lessons that would allow you to keep the materials down to a minimum, colored pencils, crayons, and count. That's the main thing. Count your materials. Jan and I count when we disseminate the material. We count when we pick it up. And that's the key to being safe. But that's what I would do. I would develop that type of routine by starting with a small group with a simple lesson. And even if you don't have a strategic lesson in mind, just letting them do something. I've seen this happen in a facility that I was asked to observe. They didn't know what to do either, but they started just letting them sketch draw, whatever, and that in and of itself, without any great behavior objectives, not any great lesson plan, that in itself got everybody interested and, and was the beginning of a program that you can embellish upon as time goes by. I have to agree with that because I think what would be very handy and very easy was is just copy paper and colored pencils or crayons or pre-printed coloring sheets that you can get online. They, the kids really like to color. They feel very safe coloring. Um, so, and that's a good introduction for them. And once they feel safe with that, there are kids that have never colored before, and I've experienced that. So starting out small and then um, letting them free draw. They have things to say. Now be prepared. They're going to draw things that you may not expect like uh, guns and weapons and it, you know when that comes into play I usually compliment them on their wonderful drawing and say that's really beautiful but can you draw something that I can hang up and that doesn't bring attention to the fact that they're being negative at that time but just transitions them very smoothly onto creating something that they can be proud of. 
I'd like to say something about coloring. I had a meeting with an anatomical artist from the University of Toledo Medical School two weeks ago. We're putting together a lesson plan. And coloring plays an important part in students, artists, learning about anatomical art. They color a lot of things all day, every day, throughout the entire semester. Coloring uh, can play an important role in the beginning of an art program, and so can tracing. Exactly. How would you uh, talk about engaging staff? Do you, do you do any activities to engage staff, get their buy-in? Do you have any have you had any challenges? Um, we, we started here working uh, directly with the unit, with one of our toughest units, to see what we would be able to come up with over that prototype program that we instituted here. And we just dove in and uh, started working with the guys. Uh, after that, the staff were observing us, and then they bought into it. Yeah, I would have to echo Joe. I think I, the, the staff kind of self, um, they kind of gravitated towards themselves. If they're, when they're, like I said, here in our detention center, we have uh, constant eyes on supervision. Um, Safety is going to be paramount. So I think staff, when, when, when they're involved in an activity where, where youth are arguing, getting into physical altercations, or just a bickering back and forth, that makes it a long 12 hours for staff as well. Um, but if they can go into an art room, um, it, it feel that emotion and, and feel safe, feel that, sort of the, that environment that they're surrounded in, that, that makes it a, a, a better day for staff too. And then that particular hour and a half, 45 minutes, whatever it's scheduled for, goes by very fast. With us, um, unlike, unlike traditional schooling, when we have spring break and summer break, things such as that, uh, Jan and, and Joe with us, they stay here year-round. That's one of the things that we don't want to let go of and one of the things that the kids don't want to let go of, too. We keep the art program here over summer break, um, just, and we, we just keep it running year-round. It, it helps out a lot with the kids, keeping them busy, keeping them happy, and the same for staff. People who start and begin a program on a very simplistic basis are going to find out right away that the art program will create a safer environment. Everybody worries about that. You're bringing in pencils, whatever. But if you're watching what's going on and you do your counting, it'll create a safe environment. I, I have to agree. I mean, I'm so beyond counting at this point because we do have so many materials out and we do trust the kids to return them. Like I said, they don't leave the room unless everything's in place. The other thing is we do invite our staff to participate in some of the activities because it gives staff a chance to um, co-mingle with the kids and talk on a different level. And the kids really like to see that, they're, that, w that we, as artists and staff people, suddenly are on their level. And that, that feels much more accepting to them than, uh, than a security person or a staff member standing at the door and watching over them. Joe, if I recall, you've worked with some university professors uh, has there been any empirical research measuring the outcomes of the program? There is no hard and fast data out there right now. It's so new. Art programming, we can't find a lot of research. Uh, but the University of Toledo had me come in, and they said they've done research, and they found out that women and who uh, reach a certain age, a certain stage in life, would love to come to the university. Could you do something for us? Because the main deterrent to women coming into the university is their fear of math. Can you do something for us? And I did a, a, a couple, three or four semesters for the University of Toledo where we had art integrated math programming for the women, and that helped. But there's no hard, fast data. We're, st we still are, we're looking at records not too long ago, and we didn't ever complete that process, nor is there data here. It's hard to keep track of the little guys that, and girls that leave us but that's our next frontier, I think. I would love to know where they go so I could keep track and work with them after they leave. And we're going to be doing that soon. I well, think we're on the, on the verge of connecting with them and, and keeping in touch to provide opportunities. We see kids here. This is the most incredible talent. Uh, one, one little fella, he said, Mr. Joe, it's a long story, but I'll get to the crux. He said, Mr. Joe, this is what I do. And he was showing me his artwork, and he made letters. He said, I make letters, Mr. Joe. I said, what do you mean, Freddie? You make letters. Said, That's what I do. Whenever I'm in jail somewhere, I got time, I make letters. He says, you know, like, you know, you know, like that baseball team, the Tigers, they have that big D. Well, that type of D, that style. I memorize that alphabet. And would you like to see me? 
do the whole alphabet? I said, no, Freddie, I don't have time for A to Z right now in old English type style, but let me see some other things. He showed me all kinds of letters that he created, fonts of his own. So there are so many things that they get involved in that they love to do. If I could keep contact with Freddie, I could say, hey, Freddie, when you're out, boom, I'm going to put you to work here. I'm going to have you shadow and job shadow some people there. That's our next frontier by, by staying in contact with them more than we do. Well, we, we've already started that, and I'm in contact with three of our students, uh, Taylor being one of them that you saw in the video. I have another one scheduled to actually uh, be in one of my classes this Saturday at the Contemporary Craft, because I teach all over the city. I also have another one that just called me the other night that will be working with me, and we have scholarship money available from the Society of Contemporary Craft and from the Children's Museum. And on another note, I've solicited a space for pop-up studio. We have five private funders, and we have five volunteer teachers ready to go. Our problem has been um, getting them beyond placement, because by the time they leave us, they may have uh, anywhere from three months to a year to serve. So we, it's lost in the transition. So we're now working through the probation offices to try to keep contact with the kids so that when they're released, they come back to us. Uh, another thing we're doing here, in, in a sense, touches on keeping track, is in the last two months, I've been working with the Toledo Museum of Art and have met with our Judge Cubbon, lead administrative judge in terms of uh, youth programming. And tomorrow we're going to finalize a program because the university, in a meeting I had with them last, last week, offered to us full scholarships to anybody on probation, anybody in, in detention, leaving detention, any of the youth in YTC, and in foster care. Uh, anybody that we recommend, they're going to give us full scholarships. So in, in a way, and to any program they offer, by the way. Plus, they're going to reimburse us for transportation. So in a way, I'll be able to keep track of these little people and say, listen, do you really like this or like that? And then I'll put you in that program. So I'm going to be keeping track in that way. But there is not a formal process in place yet. But soon, we hope to be able to do that. Would you suggest any type of special training for artists that are going inside a facility for the first time um, to engage in art programming? Yeah, uh, we get asked that question all the time. We don't need necessarily people with art degrees. We can teach the basic fundamentals to create an enticing, exciting, engaging, stimulating program for kids. We need a certain type of person, though. You need that person with that empathy, with that, that can build that rapport, that can work with the kids. You need a certain type of person. Uh, I've seen it time and time and again where I had uh, an education major in criminal justice tour this facility. And after two tours, uh, they quickly dropped that major and went into something else. Uh, you're looking for people who have a certain type of ability to work with youth. That empathetic person, uh, that sincere, non-judgmental, that can can see a little Freddy do something wrong and turn the cheek and come back in the next day and let's do it again. Let's try again. You need a certain type of person. That's what you need more. We can teach them the fundamental art lessons and we can, we, you don't have to have a degree in art history or in art therapy to do it. We do. Jan does and, and I have all my degrees, but that's not the important thing. You need a certain type of individual. I also think that the re a good resource is your local art centers because I, as um, visiting artists, I invite um, working artists to come and do a lesson with them, and we've had very much success with that because they always care. They already carry that empathy and all those qualities um, with them. So as long as there's security in the room and the artists feel safe, I think they'll be surprised how welcoming the kids are. We had. I had a um, iron worker come in who was, and he creates, um, he's a blacksmith, creates um, uh, all the armor and helmets for the Renaissance Festival. So he brought his armor and helmets and all of his uh, paraphernalia that he makes. And we had one security in the room uh, along with our ratio of youth care workers, and the kids were just 
you know, beside themselves that they could actually touch the pieces that we're working with. And he was so excellent with them. And I've had painters come in. Um, and these are all working artists, and they all can be located through your local art center, the education departments. I tried to develop a, well, I did have a, a job program for, for kids in 2001 from the Toledo Public School System. For the first half of the year, I put them to work with artists in the symphony, in the ballet performing arts, and in the graphic arts at the museum. Second half of the year, I put them to work in private sector businesses. <clears throat> and I found out that when I looked for people to have the kids come and work for them in the private sector business that had an art bent to it, in 30 seconds, everybody said yes, except for one guy. He, he had a, a business that created high-rise, uh, uh, very highly elevated signage. We couldn't put the kids up there. But everybody else in 30, in 30 seconds said, sure, bring the kid. I was one of them. You hear that all the time. They are the most giving, wonderful people you're ever going to meet. Uh, do you have another question for me, by the way? I've I want got to time for maybe seven. one or two more, and then we're going to have to, to wrap okay. it up for the day. Uh, Go ahead. Jerry, I know that you're you're funded through Title I. Uh, can you give any specifics on that? Is the Title I funding possible because of the academic integration? Is it Title I neglected and delinquent funding? Well, I, we are, the program was created when I was hired. Um, Title I was just coming into our facility. So um, I know they, they started with the reading, writing, and math, and then the following year they got the Title I funding for the arts. I think uh, that, that has to probably be worked with whoever your Title I coordinator is. Um, I make a point of trying to integrate math. We do a lot of uh, writing in our class. And I'm sorry I lost the screen on the presentation, so I couldn't get into that. But everybody will have the um, notes on that and can also contact me. But we do a lot of writing in our uh, department, in our art department. So I think incorporating that with whoever's in charge of Title I um, and making certain that it sort of uh, blends in with the um, other curriculum because we do a lot of collaboration as well. I also get funded by this organization. And um, for the first time, we were actually funded separately for the, by the County of Allegheny to do a special project. So there are funding sources available. You just got to get people on board and, and you know pitch them how important the arts is. And, and that hasn't, in my area, that hasn't been really hard to do because I've been doing this all solo. It's just in this last year that um, the, uh, the county has gotten on board and um, that it's been a far easier, easier reach um, to ask foundations for money and um, to help support our efforts here. I will let this one be the last question. Um, are there any issues dealing with, with privacy concerns since obviously the youth are minors? Um, we their create artwork we, uh, here, before we went on exhibit, we created legal letters for the reason of anonymity. We sent those letters out to parents, um, and specifically saying we were only going to mention first name and last initial. I also made personal phone calls to every parent before we exhibited any of the materials, any of the artwork. And that was done uh, in the presence of another person. So we covered bases as far as the legalities. And then those letters were returned with signatures of parent or guardian. And we kept them on file um, um, throughout the uh, ex exhibition of tra uh, that traveled for uh, the five locations. And um, we have them. So before we exhibited anything, we made sure we were covered on, on all legal bases. Joe, any final comments, or Dan? Uh, I would like to comment to number 17, the question. How can you get this uh, done when kids are here for a, long, uh, for a short period of time? How do you get a lesson done? Our lessons are designed to begin on a Monday and be completed on a Friday. The, the lesson plan is written in such a way that it gets done in that week. Uh, mm -hmm. The other question was, can, what do you do in number 18 asked? What about in prison? Can you do something like this in prison? Exactly what we do here, it would work and be a success in prison. I've seen it done. And what about probation? In Toledo, this facility several years ago had a wonderful five-year uh, program 
in the arts for, for kids on probation. And they, would, they came to us on a Friday. And the kids on probation started with glass torch work at the Toledo Museum of Art the first year. We had a 40-week program. We kept them very busy learning how to work with a torch, and it was fabulous. Uh, it was recommended for Governor's Award at that time. We didn't win it, but we were recommended. We were pleased just to get the recommendation. After that, we went to glass blowing, glass etch, cold glass fusion with these kids, and it came to a point <clears throat> in year four that we didn't have enough studio time in a glass blowing facility at the Toledo Museum of Art. I had to go to two other uh, glass studios to get time to accommodate the kids. And probation, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is probation is a, is a great opportunity for kids to work with the arts in many different areas of your community. It really worked out well for us. They absolutely loved it. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to to wrap things up for today. We've got a hard out here at the bottom of the hour. Um, there's certainly been a ton of dialogue.